Welcome to Out of the Question, a podcast that looks behind some common questions and uncovers the question behind the question while providing real solutions for biblical world and life view. Your host is Andrea Schwartz, a teacher and mentor and founder of the Chalcedon Teacher Training Institute. Psalm 127.1 reads as follows. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. Many might and should ask, how does the Lord build the house that we're also building? Some simplistic answers might include, well, if you want to do it that way, just follow the Bible. Do what God says. These fall into the category of abstract answers if one does not receive instruction as to how to proceed. Prior to commanding what we refer to as the Great Commission, Jesus promised those he addressed with the certainty that they would succeed. After all, he said, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Therefore, that was the premise of his instruction to disciple the nations, or another way of saying it is, go make disciples. But what if you've already been discipled and you still find it difficult to know how to make decisions and weigh options? Well, my guests today, Nancy and Don Wilk, have a blueprint that they have found helpful in their own lives and are now disseminating it to various groups, schools, sometimes governmental offices, nonprofits, pregnancy resource centers, as a plan to succeed in having the Lord build your house with you. Now, for those of you who have been around for a while, Don and Nancy are longtime supporters of Calcedon. Nancy and I also did a homeschooling podcast back in 2018, helping new and seasoned homeschool moms maneuver their way through various things, since both Nancy and I are gray-haired veterans of the enterprise. So thanks for joining me today, Nancy and Don. Thank you, Andrea. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes, 2018, that seems like forever ago and just yesterday. It's such a pleasure to be here with you again. So you have created a family ministry in Appomattox called Church and Maine. And Church and Maine does a variety of things. And maybe at the end, we can talk about what Church and Maine does. But specifically, you have recently embarked on something called the 321 outline for life. Please define what that is and explain how it works. Well, 321 started 40 years ago out of my own need for clarity and direction and stability in my life. You see, in 1981, in January of 1981, I became a new Christian. In February of that year, I turned 21. In March, I met a guy. In April, I got pregnant. In June, I got married. And in December of that year, delivered a premature baby. So I was a new Christian, a new wife, a new mom, and had no clue about how to do life, much less a life that was honoring to God. So what happened was in the process of all that stuff going on in my life, somebody gave me a Bible verse that said, it's Romans 8, 28, that God works all things together for good for them that love him and are called according to his purpose. Well, I didn't know much, but I knew that included me and this baby and this young man that said he wanted to marry me. So That's where I started really having to grapple with the the concept that God in his word is really, truly something to be counted on. It had the stability that we needed to move forward in our our lives with confidence, even when it was in a mess. Not only uh, 40 plus years ago, but ongoing in our in our marriage and then with our children and grandchildren, we still are utilizing the three, two, one. It's three, two, one for life. So it's for the entirety of our days, but also for abundant life. 
when people hear three, two, one, the next thing they expect to hear is blast off, right? So, yeah. <laughs> or three, two, one, go, you know, a countdown. So is this a countdown, three, two, one, or is it something different? Well, actually, the three in our outline is we pursue three objectives. Those three objectives are to obey God, love people, and take care of things. The two in our outline is we ask two important questions. That is, what has God's word already told me about this, whatever this happens to be? And the second question is, will I believe it? Because if we do, if we do believe it, it's going to change our mind. It's going to change our attitude and it's going to change our actions. And then the one in our outline is we practice one right answer. Tell them why we practice it, Don. Well, we practice it in the sense that we don't always get it right, but also practicing means we continually do it. Like a doctor practices medicine. It's something that that they do. And what is that one right answer? The one right answer is yes, Lord. And we know that for so many people, when they got saved, they said yes to the Lord. As we practice one right answer, we understand that it's not a one and done. It's something that we have to keep on doing and we'll never outgrow our need forever. We're going to be saying yes to the Lord. That's right. It sounds to me that what you're saying is not very different than, for example, what an athlete does. An athlete learns his craft and there are certain ways that he trains in order, let's say basketball, everybody's into basketball lately. There's many facets to the game, but he has to go back to the basics if things aren't working correctly. Would you look at three, two, one as a let's get back to the basics? That's a good way to look at it, Andrea. Yes, yes. Uh... We, we say it's simple enough for... Simple enough for the children. And then sturdy enough for the... Uh, oh, gray hairs like us. <laughs> oh, gray hairs, right. Yeah. yeah. So I have a funny story to tell you about this. I have read up on what it is you're doing, and I prepare for the podcast. Well, on Saturday, it was rather hot here. And I should preface this by saying, when I'm outside and I see critters I don't like, it's like, fine. You stay on your place and I'll stay on my place. And God created you. So I'm not going to say you weren't good. But on Saturday, as I was opening the door to let my dog back in, what I consider a giant lizard, it wasn't one of those baby lizards, came right into the house. Oh, whoa. So I had a lizard in the house and I was just about to go out. And it was like, what am I going to do? Am I going to stay here and try to Flush that lizard out. And then when I get him, I'm going to pound him. And so I was already thinking three, two, one. And I said, hmm, but does the Bible say anything about lizards? Well, yeah, I remembered in Proverbs 30 that, you know, you can hold a lizard in your hand, but are in king's palaces. So it's kind of like, you know what? This is not the biggest deal ever that there's a lizard in my house. Okay. I could be a king or a queen and the lizard would be in my house. When I came back, the lizard was trying to get out, went right back to the door. So the lizard didn't want to be in my house any more than I did. Although when he came in, he had scampered under something that I would never be able to get him out of. And so it was like, do I smash him? Do I kill him? And it's like, obey God, love people. Well, it wasn't love lizards, but a lizard is God's creation and take care of this. So knowing that the lizard wanted to leave, knowing that I wanted the lizard out, I actually committed it to, what What does the Bible say? Do I just kill life because I don't like it? The lizard and I got on the same page and that lizard left. And I made it so <laughs> that I could open the door and the lizard would go out. Now, that may sound ridiculous to people, but the lizard was a big problem for me. And my husband wasn't here to say, hey, go take care of that lizard. I had to do it. There are more important decisions and crises in life than a lizard. Tell me and my listeners how you have found in either personal situations or as you've applied this to other people that they've been able to find their way out of their dilemma to resolution. 
Well, let me just share with you an illustration that somebody gave us recently. The lady said that of all the Bible verses she knows, all the Bible verses she knows, they feel like color crayons strewn all over the floor. And the three to one outline for life helps her know which one to pick up and use. So I think that's a really great analogy of how to use this. It really does put things in a priority for us. When we share the three to one outline, I hold up my three last fingers, my tall man finger, my ring finger, and my pinky finger to show the three. And that puts these three things of obeying God, loving people, and take care of things in their proper order. So the first thing that we have to do is to think, how do we obey God in this situation? And then the second thing we think is, how do we love people in this situation? And third thing is, how do we take care of things? So if you would consider the first and second of our objectives to be analogous to the first and second greatest commandment, Jesus, when asked what was the uh, greatest commandment, he said it was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second one is like it, is to love our neighbor as ourself. So a lot of people think this command of loving um, God is a New Testament concept, or loving Jesus is a New Testament concept. But we find out that Jesus was actually quoting back in Deuteronomy. So we have to think if we're going to love him, he says if we love him, we'll obey him. So we have to go back and say, what does what does it what does it look like to obey God? So we when we teach our three two one outline, we go and start back with the Ten Commandments. And what's really funny is we do a pretest. Everybody says, "Oh yeah, yeah, the Ten Commandments," and we do a pretest. Guess what happens, Andrea? Oh, I I already know the answer. But what do they get? Three out of ten. <laughs> they get three out of ten, maybe, in no particular order. It's been really exciting because we teach them these very simple hand motions, you know, of one, I'm the Lord your God, have no other gods before me and teach the children to raise their one little finger as high as they can because there's nobody higher and more important than God. There's no God higher than our God. And so those types of things, we teach them the Ten Commandments. So when they have a question, what should I do with this lizard to kill the <laughs> lizard? Well, for you to have killed the lizard would not have been a violation of God's commands, right? Well, but did I have to kill the lizard? That's what Maybe. I came to terms with. But there you was other solutions. You didn't have to kill it. You're not told not to. And you went quickly to understanding that it was okay to be in, in your king's castle. You know, if it had been something else... You know, oh, yeah, I would have taken out an alligator or a crocodile. You yeah, yeah, would've. I would have done that. You know, to protect your own life, a lizard wouldn't be hurting you. Right. But if it was a, a rattlesnake, you would have to think, okay, now I need to, based on the Sixth Amendment, I need to protect the life of myself and my dog and my husband if he comes in. Or, you know, we can't just leave this rattlesnake rattling around. So it allows us first to go and look and see what are God's prohibitions and what are his commands or admonitions? What is the positive aspect of protecting life look like in this situation? Yeah. So let me ask you this. The rattlesnake in your house, you don't say, excuse me, sir, I have to go to my concordance and find out how to apply the commandment thou shalt not kill. So as people embrace these objectives and ask their questions, it should prompt people on to study and learning because you don't always have the time to say, well, this is what I should do. So Don, speak to that. What kind of preparation is advised by your system? God, we have to know the word of God. We have to know his commands in order to obey them. So that's, it always comes back to being in the word, so to speak. And, hiding his word in our hearts so we don't sin against him. 
So we're, we're not necessarily saying that there's always going to be a, you know, a single verse that's applicable to whatever lizard is in your house <laughs> at, at that time, but there could, but certainly can be. Right. We're looking for the, you know, the entirety of scripture, mm-hmm. scripture being uh, a unity. So we're not giving people answers. We want to continue to point them to the answer, you know, to, you know, to scripture. Yeah. So the outline is really an outline. It's a tool. It's just a tool. It's, it's not going to give you the answers. It's just going to help you find out how to do them. So the three objectives, when we wonder what we're supposed to do, the three objectives help us remember. And when we need to know what's true, the two questions help us find the answer. And then the one answer, yes, Lord, it's right every time. So these three objectives, these two questions, and this one answer is an ongoing process. It's an ongoing framework that every time we have opportunity or need to stop and consider what does what does God say about this? Am I going to believe it? Because there's a whole lot of things, Andre, that's going to change in our world if we believe what God says. And all too often we say, oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus. I love Jesus. But then we don't live in terms of that. We don't we don't learn as his disciples. We don't live as his his children, his ambassadors. We don't represent him well. And so what this outline does is just helps us and reminds us to stop and look at those things. You know, I think that if we really did believe not just in the Lord, but believed him enough to do what he says, there's a whole lot of things that would be different. Yeah. So our our prayer most of the time probably should be, Lord, help me with my unbelief, right? You know, that's interesting that you say that, because if you suggested to some people, some believing Christians, people who you you have no doubt that they love the Lord, sometimes they're insulted if you say you're not acting based on your premises, you're not acting on belief. And Mm -hmm. instead of saying, thanks for the exhortation, it sort of becomes, well, what are you saying to me? Are you saying that I'm not a good Christian? Well, I think if we were honest, we can all look in the mirror and say, we are not good Christians. The only good part about us is the fact that the Holy Spirit indwells us. And part of why we are given the Holy Spirit is to convict us of what's right. So all this really is, is a way in which to process quickly, if you don't have time, but slower, if you do have time to say, okay, I've got options here. Which one of these options, are any of these options godly? If I don't seem to have any, you know, options that are godly, then I got to go back and maybe reassess what the situation is. Right. Right. And and it's, it's not a substitute for prayer, but often we, we already know what to do. We just don't do it. Don't do it. I'll give you a good example. You're in Virginia. I'm in California, but we have a, a good number of people who position themselves on freeway exits with signs asking for money. And it's always interesting for me to see which cars ahead of me roll down their windows and pull out the $20 bill or something and give it to the person. Now, the people are good at sort of making you feel as though the right tug would be to go ahead and do this. But if you were pursuing the three objectives Obey mm-hmm. God. What does God say? Love people. Would, would handing this man or this woman twenty dollars would that be loving them? Especially if you don't know what they're going to do with that money, and then take care of things. I think a lot of the, for lack of a better term, social justice guilt that's often inflicted on us. If we can reason biblically, then if we say, "Well, okay, I don't think I'm doing enough." in terms of Christian works of charity, well, then maybe you'll direct yourself to something that will be that way, but not feeling like if I just give this guy $20, I'll have done my due diligence. When we hold up our three fingers for our three objectives, it reminds us of the proper order. And all too often in our culture, people want to love one another. 
And so a lot of times they put that as the priority and their, their sentimental feelings or emotions or sense of guilt or misplaced responsibility, all kinds of things can come out by trying to love others before we put it in the context of obeying God. So God has some things to say about how do we minister to the poor and needy in our community. And with it always comes a context of a relationship where they can be discipled, I think. Yeah, the idea of not just throwing money at a problem, or I guess in the case that you you present, Andrea, you, you actually see the person, but all too often you can just send stuff anonymously, and I'm sure it helps if it's used properly, but uh, I don't know that that's particularly what Scripture is, is teaches us and commands us. Right. So the more we're involved with Scripture, certain things will come to mind. For me, is this person working? Is this person just asking for money? The Scripture says if you don't work, you shouldn't eat, which right. makes a lot of the blind charity, as you alluded to, Don, you don't know where you're giving your money. You don't know why. So what we have to be careful, and I think your outline helps, is to not to go off into some humanistic, emotional, sentimental thing that will make a lovely Facebook post for somebody and do what God says. But it's the take care of things is important because it doesn't mean I'll obey God. I'll love people. But it indicates there's something you're supposed to do. You're supposed to take care of things. And which things are your things to take care of? Exactly. So I get that reminder every, every day when I, when I look at some of the, some of the rooms in our, in our house here. I got to take care of that better. You know, that's interesting because I think a lot of times when we get down and the world is nasty to us or whatever, we think that the solution is the quote unquote problem being solved when in actual fact, it's what's in front of me that I can do the taking care of things. So you know what, when that lizard was trying to leave and then I was trying to help it and it ran away because it, it still thought that I was trying to kill it probably, you know, and it's just like, I can go do the dishes. I, I can go put away my groceries. When I came back, the lizard was finally in a position that I could open the door and he gets to go away. So we don't have to make our problems so much in our face that we stop doing everything else. Yes, that's right. What this does is, like you said, it doesn't put our problems in our face. It reminds us of our proper action and our proper posture before the circumstances that the Lord has got us in. Right. You know? A way to to take every thought captive, right? Yes. Yes. The obedience of Christ. It helps us to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ and helps us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And sometimes people don't believe that if you do that, that if you seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that all the other stuff takes care of itself. We have a piece of family history where we didn't really have much when we got married and we were convinced by good friends, and I'll put that in quote, that what we needed to do is get lots of credit cards and bring the balance up so that we would become a better credit risk when we wanted to go ahead and buy things because they'll say, oh, look, they have credit cards. Well, we were happily in about $25,000 worth of debt until I happened to read in Rush Juni's Law and Liberty that that was not honoring God. So it wasn't enough to say, okay, God, we won't do that. We had to go through the process of paying down that debt without incurring more debt. So sometimes the take care of things isn't necessarily going to be smooth roads, but there's something about doing the right thing. And by God's grace, we got out of debt. Yeah. And that I think you, you kind of referred to it earlier, Andre, but the, the taking care of things, is it, it's going to start right with with uh, with me it's that self governing of myself that, that I'm responsible for first yes. and yeah. it's not like if god would just take care of that other person i would be fine <laughs> it yeah. never works that way i got this terrible problem andrea i think you do too it's wherever i go there i am mm-hmm. so you know it's like if there's a problem here it's it 
I, I'm not going to fix it by going somewhere else. Because if I'm not self-governing, if I'm not navigating my circumstances in terms of what God says is true and his call in my life, then I'm missing a huge part of why why he he left us here. You know, mm-hmm. because Christianity and so many, so many times people feel like Christianity is just about my happy heart and what happens after I die. But we have instructions. We have work to do in taking care of things. We talk about the general responsibility of stewardship and how work is a good thing. It, it was given to Adam and Eve in the garden and work is not a curse. It's a blessing. And when we're faithful with a little, we get rewarded with more. So, you know, taking care of things, you know, it might start small. I think it starts with teaching a child whenever they are big enough to take a toy out of the box, they're big enough to put it back into the box. That's where we, as simple as we start Mm -hmm. taking care of our things. I've recently had this with some parents who are telling me that their children lie. Well, first of all, don't be so surprised. Your children, yes, they are participating in the fall. This is not new. And if you look back on your life, you probably did as well. But what do you do with a lie? Well, it's a perfect opportunity to teach what the Bible says about perjury, what the Bible says about slander and false witness. And so if you take care of things while they're happening in a small way, then they never get to a big way because lying about who ate the cookie is insignificant compared to, yes, he stabbed that guy. Yes, but it's important for people to understand that in this outline, we go back and look at the law of God first so that don't tell a lie isn't just my preference. You know, it's not the the mama's going to get mad. Mama. Yeah. The, the objective here is not to keep daddy or mama from being mad. The objective here is to obey God. He tells us not to lie, not to commit perjury, you know, and, and all that is found. If you study through on the ninth commandment, the second part of two is, will I believe it? Because will I believe it is a different step than I will do it. So do you separate belief from action when you're teaching this to people? We really can't separate belief from action. So no, we we don't, we don't see them as, as two separate things. I suppose they, they could happen one right after the other. You're going to believe it. You're going to do it. Then you do it. But there could be a time lag there too. I mean, we're directing people to scripture and, a lot of life situations, problems, challenges are not really easy, maybe not cut and dry, and they take a lot of a lot of working through. Yeah, if if we believe it, we're gonna do it. I mean we we can't just be hearers of God's word. We we want to be doers, have to be doers. Faith without works is dead, so we do want to reinforce and emphasize that there is is action when we need to if we believe we're gonna do. Okay, so this Brings me to some of the applications you said that you've already been implementing, that you recently came back from Texas where you were helping someone who runs a crisis pregnancy center. And the first question that people might ask is, okay, 321 is great if you're teaching your children. 321 is great if you're a believer, but like in a pregnancy resource center, the people who come in they may or may not be believers. So is this something that's just restricted to people who say, I'm a Christian? No, certainly not. When we went out there to Texas, I had opportunity to train the staff members on um, using the 321. And we had that exact question. What if um, we have a client that is not a believer? And my answer to her was that, their recognition of God doesn't mean that he's not God. These are still our objectives as people of God. They are a Christ-centered ministry. So they are specifically helping women bring their babies to term and either parent or adopt, but they, they do not offer abortion as an option. And so they say they're Christ-centered. So because of that, as believers, 
that's still our objective, whether the people that God brings to them are Christian or not, that's still their objective. You understand? Yes. So in other words, as Christians, we operate this way. And Mm -hmm. since we should have the assumption, whether or not those around us do, that there is one God, commandment one, that there to be no idols, et cetera, et cetera, on down the line, then if we're acting with certainty, here's a person who's coming to the center in a crisis looking for some answers, it's probably more reassuring to hear someone who's advising them to have certainty. Right, because we have to recognize the sovereignty of God in bringing that particular person to this particular center. And another thing, Andrea, that we have not mentioned, this is really, really important. In the context of helping this pregnancy help center use the three to one outline, we're creating a set of videos for them to use because obviously we can't be there and, and teach it to them specifically. So we are creating a set of videos where we teach through the outline. And in addition to our three to one outline, we have three to one presuppositions. Because on the surface, you might say, anybody could say, oh, yeah, I'm going to obey God and I'm going to love people. I'm going to take care of things. A lot of people would say that. But if you're smart, you realize that there's a lot of little G.O.D.s running around here. And so the big question is, what God are we talking about? So our three, two, one presuppositions help people know exactly what God we're talking about. And we point to the triune God. The three in that presuppositional statement is God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. And so we talk a little bit about who that God is. And then we have two distinctions or two differences that we want to make a point of sharing with people. The first one is God and his creation. The second one is Jesus and his church. So those are two things that we want to make note of so that we don't have folks who might imagine that God is nature. God is not nature. Nature is part of God's creation. And then the one in our three, two, one presuppositions that there's one Lord, one faith, one hope, one baptism, and the really the unity of everything under the Lordship of Christ. And we know that he is now discipling his children and destroying his enemies. So we're going to fall on one side or the other. Everybody is going to be on one side or the other. I can see how this would be helpful, for example. You know, I know a lot of pregnancy centers, at least the ones in my area, have abstinence seminars for high school children and and things like that. Telling people, don't do this, It's not that it's not helpful, you know, better than go ahead and do this, which a lot of the public schools are teaching one way or another. But the whole idea being you have the agency to reason out, especially young girls. He says he loves me and he says, if he truly loves me and I truly love him, then I'll show it. If somebody's been trained in three, two, one, they're like, hold everybody, hold the horses here. Let me think this through. I think you'd have a lot fewer Christians who maybe move away from their faith when they come outside their family if they were given a procedure that would help them reason through, am I going to regret this? Yes. As far as the pregnancy center goes, it's going to cover a lot of ground as far as, you know, should I kill my baby? Should we keep on having sex before we're married? Should we live together? You know, because we're going to get married anyway. And Children need a mom and a dad, so let's just live together. It's going to put a biblical perspective on all of those questions that they have. Now, here's a pivotal point, Andrea, and that is one of the things that we do in our videos. We use a building analogy, like building a house. We talk, we started this with building a house. How do we know if, if the Lord is building a house in our poster? People can download a poster if they want to see it. But on our poster, we have a plumb line. 
And that plumb line is this God's standard for what's straight, right? We can't build a house unless it's straight. We also cannot build a house unless it's got a proper foundation. So that foundation has to be on Jesus. We have to have said yes to him that first time so that we have a regenerate heart and we have everything else then begins to line up in terms of him being the chief cornerstone in our life in the building of our days. For one group that we presented to, they were uh, in the the sports. So we used the sports analogy of you have to be on the team first, relating that to being in Christ. So how can we, how can we tell somebody, oh, you obey God, obey God? And they don't, they don't know God. I mean, they're an enemy of God. So, but they're still required to obey him. That's a big part of this too, because we don't, we don't presume or assume somebody already knows the Lord. We came together. We got to know each other through the ministry of Chalcedon and the idea of Christian reconstruction. So just the very term reconstruction means that there already is a construction and you're really sending people to the Bible as the architectural plans on how God wants us to live. And a lot of people are like, I just wish I could evangelize people. I just wish that I was in a position to be better. It seems to me that three, two, one understood and applied is the key that opens up a lot of doors that might be closed because, oh, no, 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 we don't talk about the Bible. Well, okay, you don't have to talk about the Bible, but since we know the Bible is true, we're going to talk about the Bible, and we have solutions. So we've already talked about teaching children when they're young the rights and wrongs of life and how you instill in them this ability to think. We talked about unwanted pregnancies. We talked about people being swayed into ungodly intimacy. But Nancy, you were sharing with me that you have some public servants in some states who are interested in applying this in terms of dealing with welfare and homelessness. Share a little bit about that because I think that's important. Yes. Well, we, we, you know, we pray that that comes to fruition, but the Lord does speak to those things in his word. So, you know, when we, when we look at as families, as people, we're supposed to be productive. The husbands, specifically the husbands are to be providing for their families. So, you know, to, ha- to leave women and children to the welfare state is not taking care of the thing, is not obeying God. It's not loving that, that woman or that child. And it's not taking care of the things that that man is responsible for. So it's simple. It can be applied in really, it really can be applied in every area of life because the Bible talks about every area of life. And it's not just for believers. As believers, we're supposed to be teaching them to obey. And their regenerate heart is really between them and the Lord. I still have a responsibility to teach them what God has said we're supposed to be doing. That's the Great Commission. Go out and teach. Yeah. It is. Not go out and convert. Not go out and make nicey nice. It's to teach and leave it to the Holy Spirit because we didn't convert ourselves. We don't Mm -hmm. convert our children. Mm -hmm. We can't even change ourselves on our nasty habits or our wrong way of thinking without the intervention of the Holy Spirit. So I find this as a very useful way to get the nose of the camel under the tent, because once you're in there and without reservation, you're saying, I know this outline of approaching life can help. We appreciate the uh, the encouragement and, and you, you saying that, Andrea, It's kind of humbling because this is something that we have been just doing, right? This is a paradigm that can be adjusted and whatever. But what I love about it is you've got years of knowing it works. So it wasn't like, oh, let's have this idea. Let's do this. Well, I don't know. We've never tried it. You you lived it enough and to realize that, oh, wow, maybe Mm -hmm. everybody doesn't approach it this way. We've got something to share. 
Yeah, yeah, and then we get we get people who who uh, use it, apply it, and they tell us the, the their tell story. Us. And yeah, there was one recently with a family uh, choosing to homeschool their their uh, their daughter. Right. So uh, let me just back up here a minute. We do know that it applies in our our family. It's kind of weird, you know, because we think this is just the Wilkes being Wilkes. But what's happened over the years is as we talk about this, we've had people say, wait, stop. I want to write that down (laughs) and ask me to repeat it so they can write it down. And then we were asked for it to be used in a... Christian school about this time last year. So at the Christian school, we were able to go in and do an in-service with their teachers and talk the three to one to all their teachers. Then we taught it to a, a parents group and then we presented it to all of the students. And then the principal used it ongoing in their chapel. So then in April, we were asked through FCA, that's the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, to present it three weeks of teaching in the public high school here with their athletes. I've done it in ladies' conference situation and then the pregnancy center. And and you mentioned the potential for the state. I want you to understand this is not just a personal it's not just about our personal faith it's not even just about our our family's culture it is the word of god and it is applicable in every sphere of governance under god and so whether that is at work or at school or on a state level or even on a national level We should stop and think, are we going to obey God? Are we going to love people? Are we going to take care of these things? What has God's word told me about this? Whatever it is, and will I believe him? Because only in obedience is there blessing. And we will otherwise incur, the Bible calls them curses. It is consequences of our own poor choices, whether that's in ignorance or unbelief. But we've got to turn this ship around. And that is one of the things that we have stewardship obligation of right now. I think that it's not just a personal tool, but the Lord has called us to articulate it and to format it in a way that other people can use it. Because there's need for it. It's a teaching tool. Okay, so Church in Maine is your umbrella organization or ministry. If there are those who would like to find out more, how do they reach you? And how do you offer training to groups that say, oh, yeah, my company needs this. My school needs this. We, we certainly do. If you want to reach us regarding the 321, email us at 3 3- Two one at churchmain.com. People can also go to that website, 321outline.com, and download the outline. You'll see there that on our website, we ask, what is it that we're supposed to be doing? What is true? Who should I believe? So whether it's for the first time you're wondering those things, or the millionth time, or the last time before we enter eternity and find out everything in its fullness, that is going to be questions that we all always have. To, it's always going to come up. We're always going to be asking those things. We've always all come to a place of overwhelm when we have to say, wait, what am I supposed to be doing here? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. And so I imagine that as people contact you, you have a structure in place as to how you get to their organization you have to live. So there are probably fees attached to viewing the videos. But I want to applaud you because I know you too, and I've known you too for a while. And and this may sound bad, (laughs) what I'm about to say, but I don't mean it bad. You see something, somebody asks you something, and you jump in. And then sometimes you've jumped in and you're like, what did we just jump into? (laughs) And But you don't retreat. You don't say, okay, this was a bad idea. Sorry. (laughs) The interactions we've had, you've kept your word 
and you worked through the difficulties. And I've seen you go through difficulties. And what's so impressive is without knowing that you were three, two, one-ing yourselves, I didn't know that's what you were doing. But now I have a better sense as to why you were able to stay the course. Well, thank you, yeah, Andrea. Yes. I appreciate that, Andrea. Thank you. It is the it's grace of God in our life. Yeah. yeah. And we appreciate you and uh, Kelsey and uh, efforts and support. And, and we rely heavily on, on, on y'all. Oh, well, that's good to know. Well, listeners, make use of www.321outline.com. And I believe the O in outline has to be capitalized. But uh, I downloaded the chart and I have it in front of me. And as silly as it sounded, it helped me with Larry the Lizard. And I'm very grateful. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Out of the question podcast at gmail.com is how you reach us. And thanks again for tuning in. Thanks for listening to Out of the Question. For more information on this and other topics, please visit calcedon.edu.